You're listening to the Precision Shooting Podcast, discussing all aspects of precision and long range rifle shooting. This episode is brought to you by Impact Dynamics, advanced training for the precision shooter. And now, over to your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to the Precision Shooting Podcast. My name is Rusty, and joining me all the way from the United States of America is Mr. John McQuay from 8541 Tactical. John, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great, Rusty. I appreciate you having me on the podcast here. No, I certainly appreciate having you on board, mate. It was uh, it was a shame we didn't get over to shot show this year, but we did get over last year and have a chat with you there. So thanks for coming on board and, and being our eyes and ears from the show. That's no problem at all. So, John, for those who are listening and don't may not be familiar with what you do, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what 8541 Tactical is? Well, 8541 Tactical is a, we're a new media company, and we really deliver our content through two ways. Uh, One is through our website at 8541tactical.com, but our primary avenue is through our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's also 8541tactical.com. I'm sorry, 8541tactical on YouTube. And uh, right now we have about 80,000 subscribers on there. I, I can't remember how many videos we have, 400 plus some odd videos. And we cater mainly to precision rifle shooters, although we do a little bit of pistol and uh, carbine stuff as well. Uh, the biggest question that we usually get is, uh, what is the significance of 8541? <laughs> Uh, and 8541 is the military occupational specialty for a Marine Corps scout sniper. And uh, my background is I was a Marine Corps scout sniper and a SWAT sniper on a local police department here. And I'm still a full-time police officer. Uh, but I try to take the uh, expertise and the training that I've had through all the different advantages I've had Mm -hmm. and uh, translate that to guys that don't necessarily have the ability to get out and get that kind of training or get that experience and uh, deliver it to you guys through uh, videos and uh, different content we release on our website. Absolutely. And I did see and have been listening to the podcast version of your weekly show. That's right. We uh, we do do a weekly show called Mail Call Mondays, and primarily it started out as a question and answer show on YouTube, and we got a lot of requests for a podcast version. Mm. Uh, and just uh, you can do a, a search on your favorite podcast app for Mail Call Mondays or for eighty five forty one Tactical, and uh, it should pop up on there. Uh, we are on the the YouTube pod, or I'm sorry, on the uh, Apple Podcasts and. Uh, syndicated uh in other locations as well absolutely so if you uh well, obviously if people are listening to this they know how to work a podcast so i'm sure they'll be able to track you <laughs> down as well and hit subscribe and join in on that one as well that would be really good absolutely you alluded to a little bit about how you sort of came into this position of of starting the the channel well in terms of building the knowledge base but what what went from sort of the training that you've done over over the course of your career to the point of actually going, I, I better start a YouTube channel for, for some reason because, you know, we, we know it takes a lot of time and effort to do one of those. Well, the uh, the short story that I, that I usually give is it was kind of an evolution of sorts. Um, when I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, I had a little bit of a period where I just wanted to uh, sit back and relax and not really do anything gun related for a while. And I got that out of my system and then realized that um, even though I wasn't being paid to shoot uh, precision rifles anymore, it was something I really, really enjoyed and I missed. So I started uh, searching the internet to find what exactly I wanted to put together as my own personal rifle. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, something a lot of people don't realize is the guys that are actually being paid to shoot um, very often don't know a ton about equipment. And the main reason for that is you don't get to choose what equipment you use. If you're military or law enforcement generally, you're just issued something and you're expected to uh, make the best out of it. Uh, so when I was looking at what I wanted for my own precision rifle, I knew I had uh, a lot of uh, background with the Remington 700, but the 
M40A1 that I was issued in the Marine Corps is not a commercially available rifle. So I had to go online and do a lot of research to figure out what I wanted to build up. And as I was doing this on the various different forums, I started coming across uh, technical questions uh, regarding actually shooting or uh, ballistics. And that information I knew by heart. Mm. Uh, so I was able to answer a lot of these questions because I, I kind of believe that in any community, uh, if you're willing to take, you also need to be willing to give. Uh, so... I was more than happy to give out information, but my time is limited, and so as I found myself answering the same kind of questions on shooting ballistics over and over and over again, yep. I thought, okay, well, I, I know how to make a website. I've got a little bit of an IT background, so I went ahead and started uh, my website, 8541tactical.com, and started posting some articles on you know how to's and little things. And as I went through and built up uh, my precision rifle, I posted some reviews and some things on of that nature. And I have a, a background in photography. When I was a teenager, I uh, took photography in uh, high school and, and did a bunch of that stuff. So I knew my way around a camera, and I bought a better camera in order to take better photos, a more professional camera. Um, that camera had this neat little record button on it that I was unfamiliar with and uh, figured out that the the camera actually had the ability to shoot some uh, pretty decent movies, pretty decent videos, and that started my education on uh, cinematography. Yep. And that kind of evolved into some, some really amateur YouTube videos to begin with, some basic how-to videos, and then... Uh, as I got a handle on the YouTube thing, uh, we started increasing our production value, and I started to increase my knowledge in how to utilize cameras in a more cinematic fashion. And uh, the channel just kind of took off from there, and uh, we evolved over seven or eight years to wow. the point where uh, now we're uh, producing some uh, very professional content, and we're actually uh, doing some projects for some uh, some different manufacturers you may have seen. Uh, I, I don't know if it made its way over to uh, Australia, but we did a commercial for Magneto Speed that actually ran on some uh, uh, cable channels here in the U.S. So okay. yeah. uh, we've been slowly expanding from there. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Was it a good show this year? Oh, it was uh, it was definitely a good show. Um, every year, it uh, it seems to get more tiring than the years gone by. Uh, you were there uh, last year, so you you know how uh, towards the end of the show it it tends to drag on. But uh, oh, overall, yeah. I I think there was more uh, for the precision rifle shooter this year than there was last year. Certainly got that feel from sitting back here and, and watching Facebook updates from uh, yourself and other people and. There certainly seemed to be plenty of information around. Was, was there any few things that stood out for you? Um, well, the uh, uh, first of all, obviously, the one of the big buzzes was on the uh, Magpul chassis. Uh, mm -hmm. That they kind of uh, dropped information and in press releases right before Shot Show, and uh, it was really interesting to uh, to see the reception that that chassis got online before anybody had actually uh, handled it in person. I don't, I don't know how much you followed on the, uh, the information they dropped on Facebook and on Twitter and whatnot. Yeah. We we're sort of keeping up with it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It seems that, uh, with the, I, I think Magpul did an interesting thing where they, they brought out the Hunter 700 first. You know, they brought out their, their mm. budget chassis system slash rifle stock. Uh, and so they brought that out at a very competitive price point with some uh, interesting features, but it really, uh, it wasn't up the, uh, where it really didn't have the features that the top end precision rifle shooters want. I mean, yeah, guys true. like yourself, you know, people that shoot competition and, and are really into it, you want that fully adjustable chassis system. There are various other things you want. And the Hunter 700 just didn't have it, but it did have that great price point. So, you, you know, if you had a, one of those uh, base model Remingtons that had the Tupperware stock on it, you could throw that thing on it and, uh, and get it up and running and have an accurate stock. So yeah, the, up, right. the uh, Pro chassis that they just released, 
you know, it, it has all the features that you would want from a top end chassis system. But when they released it at that uh, almost thousand dollar price point, uh, I think a lot of guys really uh, had some uh, convulsions over that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it was uh, it was funny to see the kind of the backlash online of people, uh, you know, getting upset, saying, "Oh, it'll it'll never sell at that price point." When they they didn't really stop and step back and and take a look at the other chassis systems on the market mm. that are offering those same features that are pretty much in that same price point. So. I think Magpul is still going to sell a bunch of them. Um, I just I thought it was funny to see the the dust up on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that our first reaction here was was you know a little little bit too late. You know they were, they were sort of behind the eight ball with it, but having seen some some more hands on videos with them, it's certainly uh, certainly a contender. Yeah, probably a lot better than many, many people expected. Yeah, well, they they really did something kind of novel with the uh, the fully ambidextrous features on it, being able mm. to have one chassis system that will accept either a left-handed or a right-handed action with the same exact part. Uh, that that is really interesting because you know that people always uh, clamor as soon as any new chassis system is released. Hey, that's great! I love the chassis. When are you going to bring a left-handed version? Out? <laughs> Yeah. And so coming out of the gate right away with a chassis system that can be switched over to either side, I mean, it's smart from a marketing standpoint and it's smart from a, a manufacturing standpoint as well because now they mm. don't have to manufacture two different parts so they don't have to do a run of left-handed and a run of right-handed. They run the same thing and then you just switch the uh, the cutout in the inlet to whichever side you need. Mm. Yeah, it's a, a smart move, and it's certainly yeah. You do see that big delay, and and unfortunately, our, well, not unfortunately, one of our uh, podcast members has a, a fair distaste for left-handers, so he won't be too pleased. But the <laughs> I know the question always is, well, when it's when is the left hand? When is the left hand? And, and to have something hit the market that not isn't waiting on a second second model is is straight out. And from a from a supplier point of view, you know, you never know how many left-handed stocks to get or is this whatever accessory it is every item is both which which works out really really well it's well thought through well engineered yeah yeah it is and uh the the other really neat thing that they did on it of course is they they made the hinge ambidextrous as well so if you Mm. get the the folding version uh you can choose which side uh you want that uh, stock to fold to and it's designed to fold over the bolt handle and encapsulate the bolt handle Uh, so Again, that's a that's a really cool design that usually you only find on the uh, the upper end chassis systems. So, I think they uh, they ended up coming in at a nice price point. Obviously, I would I would prefer it to be a lower price point. I wish they could bring that same feature set out in a uh, five hundred dollar chassis, but uh, that just isn't going to happen. No, not not realistic. So, but yes, but overall. The uh, it does have a, a full internal aluminum skeleton. I think there were a lot of guys that had the misconception that it was a uh, it was like the same construction of the Hunter 700, where most of the stock was injection molded. But no, it actually it is a, a full aluminum internal skeleton in it. Yeah, I think it certainly uh, certainly turns them heads. It was good. There was a few, I guess, few chassis sort of releases uh, this year. Uh, yeah, we, the other one that we, uh, got over and saw was the, uh, modular driven technologies. They released, uh, some updates to their, uh, ESS chassis and to their skeleton mm-hmm. stock. And they, uh, released a new, uh, double folding hinge setup on their system. Uh, so it, uh, is an ambidextrous folder as well. And, uh, that one will, uh, fold over. And encapsulate the uh, the bolt handle as well. So they made an update to the skeleton stock that uh, took out one of the adjustment wheels. So now you have a recess in the middle of the skeleton stock that will allow the bolt handle to stick in there. Yeah, very good. Yeah, okay. I, I, I hadn't seen that particular one. That's yeah, uh, it's nice. it, it it's a really interesting setup because it actually is. Uh, I can't remember exactly what they call it, but it's a dual hinge type setup. So where your normal folding buttstock only has uh, one pivot point, uh, this one has two pivot points. So you kind of have a center section that swings over to the side. 
And what that does is it makes the hinge very, very low profile because the pivot can be in the middle of the stock instead of having to have a hinge hanging out to one side or the other. And depending upon the placement of that hinge, you can start to get those hinges really close to your mouth when you're shooting. Yeah, and, yeah uh, absolutely. You know, if you're shooting a uh, 223, that's not a big deal. If you're shooting a 300 Win Mag, you start to get a little bit uh, concerned <laughs> about uh, losing some dental work when that hinge gets a little too close. <laughs> so uh, it's nice that they they designed this dual folding system so that it is uh, really low profile when it's when it's locked out. It's smooth on either side, just like the original skeleton stock. And then when it folds, it still keeps the uh, butt stock uh, very close to the actual uh, chassis system itself. And again, you can either encapsulate the uh, bolt handle or you can flip the hinge and go the other direction and not. And so uh, it's a really uh, slick design overall and it locks up really solid. They had uh, a pre-production version on display there. I'm looking forward to getting the production version in and uh, see uh, how sturdy that guy actually is. When's that due for release? Um, the hinge uh, should be very soon. I'll look at my notes right here and see if I had the uh, the release date written down. Um, now it doesn't look like I had the release date written down in my in my notes here, but uh, it should be yeah, it should be pretty soon. It was uh, I believe the the version they had it the buttons on it were not uh, not finished in a, a nitride oh, okay. or a black and finished. They were still kind of raw. So that's usually uh, an indicator that that was a pre-production version. Um, but uh, they should be, uh, if not shipping already, that should be very soon. Okay, uh, so real close. Yeah. They also had uh, their new uh, Gen 2 for their LSS XL chassis, which is just kind of a more affordable uh, open-top chassis system. Uh, but it's still got a really cool assortment of features. It has that uh, mm -hmm. AR pistol grip, and it'll accept uh, AR-style butt stocks. Uh, but they took some of the features from the uh, ESS and transplanted those over into the LSS Gen 2 overall uh, design features. Like above the pistol grip, you have ramps for your thumb. So if yep. you want to run your thumb on the same side instead of wrapping it around the pistol grip, yeah. then you've got a really nice set of ramps there. And one of the coolest features on the LSS uh, XL Gen 2 is that instead of uh, where the the extension tube screws in for your AR style buttstock, usually mm -hmm. that section of the chassis is really fat because it's got to accommodate that uh, that screw in section, yep. and that's there's generally no way to get that narrower. Well, what they did is they brought that back a little bit, and then they cut into the chassis. So then instead of pushing your thumb way out to the side, you have kind of an indent there next to the thumb ramps uh, that allows to keep your thumb in a little bit more of a comfortable position and closer to the tang on the, yeah, the rifle. See. I'm just having a look at one now and I see what you mean. Yeah, that's a good little, uh, good little change up. Yeah, it's, it's really comfortable. Uh, it's really nice overall and uh, it's a really attractive system. And of course, it's... It has that open top design, so it saves you a little bit of weight. It saves you a little yep. bit of complexity because the, the fore end is one piece uh, with the center section. It's a really rigid, really strong chassis. Okay. But then if you need to run night vision or you need to run something mounted in front of your optic, uh, they do sell a night vision bridge that will just mount into the uh, M-lock slots okay. and then okay. enclose the fore end so you can, you can throw stuff up there. Oh, brilliant. The other one in that chassis uh, release or stock slash chassis release was the the Bravo from yes. KRG. Did you have a play with one of them? Well, we actually uh, we got one a little bit before the show, and uh, yep. we released our review on it before we actually got out to SHOT Show. And yes. the, uh, the Bravo is a really, really exciting chassis. It comes in at a really low price point. This is one where it... You know, it shoots for that uh, that Magpul Hunter 700 price point, but I think uh, it really has features on it that put it well above the Hunter 700. 
Uh, the the Bravo has got a, a toolless comb height adjustment on it, whereas like the 700, you have to swap in different modules to get the right comb height. Uh, so you just have a thumb wheel on the side that you can loosen up and then slide your cheek piece to wherever you need it on the Bravo. And then it's also uh, it's got a almost totally vertical uh, pistol grip area on yep. the uh, the Bravo. So. I really didn't like the angle that the Hunter 700 was at. You know, some guys that are used to the old style hunting stocks really like it. Uh, but for me, um, I really prefer a more vertical uh, pistol grip angle just to get my wrist in a better position. Hmm. Uh, and the, uh, the Bravo has that, and it also has a pretty aggressive palm swell on it, too. So it's a really uh, meaty feeling overall grip. Yeah, they do look good, and, and I know that Howa have released one as like a OEM sort of setup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, Howa also had uh, had some really cool stuff uh, set up in their booth. They're they're going to be bringing out the uh, the Howa fifteen hundred in the Bravo chassis, uh, but they also had some uh, some Lithgow rifles on display. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, uh, not surprised about that. We certainly tracked a little bit of information about them. Now, without being completely biased, what, what did you think of them? Oh, I really liked it. The uh, I believe it was the LA-105. Yeah, the uh, Woomera. Yeah, that's a, that's a beast of a rifle. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Woomera is only about 300 miles north of where I live. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite quite close here. So they, they said the name is uh, is Aborigine for uh, a spear thrower? I do believe so, yeah. So that's yeah. that's what they told me out there, so I thought that was uh, that was kind of interesting. But the, the rifle overall is, uh, it's a really, it appears to be a really overbuilt rifle. It's got a really thick uh, bolt body on it, probably the, the thickest bolt mm-hmm. body I think I've seen on a short action type rifle. It's big, uh, isn't it? Yeah. It had... Yeah, it has the uh, three lug bolt. I believe it's a sixty degree bolt lift. It's a really short, uh, really smooth bolt lift and bolt throw on it. So um, I was really impressed overall. And they had the uh, the one hundred five that they had there. They had in a KRG X ray chassis. Yep. Um, and uh, it it worked really well. It runs on uh, AICS magazines, and I believe the one that I was shooting at the range was a six uh, five Creedmoor. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what they're they're targeting for their competition ready package. And the uh, I, if I remember right, the price point they said was going to be about two thousand dollars US. Uh, uh, that rings a bell. Yeah, they're they're uh, sort of adjusted for the, the dollar here. Um, mm-hmm. That they, they sort of sit around the twenty seven hundred mark here. And look, we've been we've been excited. We actually have a connection with Lithgo. We run training courses out of their facility, so we have. The listeners of the podcast will know we've been there and had had a bit of the tour of the place, and those uh, 105s have have captured our attention immensely. So I was I was curious to see what you thought. Yeah, it's a it it's a really interesting rifle. Obviously, at, at shot show, um, you don't get a good sense of accuracy on things. Yep. Uh, you know, you can bang long range steel out at the range, but uh, you don't uh, you don't really get to shoot uh, paper for groups. Sure, uh, but all the uh, all the things that I looked for were there on the rifle, and and overall, it uh, it really is an exciting package at a really nice price point. And I'm sure uh, I'm sure you guys uh, down there in Australia will be happy. It'll be one of the few things that will probably not be more expensive in Australia than it is in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right there. I I'm gonna I'm gonna send you uh, through a a picture of uh, some of the groups that I have seen out of that particular gun that you're talking about. So we'll send that through to you. And, and accuracy, I don't think, is going to be an issue for those. They seem very good. Yeah, so it's uh, that was uh, that was a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool setup there. And, uh, of course, they got us on one of their uh, their mini chassis rifles at Howa as oh, well. Yes. yep. And... Uh, that uh, that little guy, I believe, was a six five Grendel, uh, and it was in a uh, MDT chassis, and it's uh, it is a cool little setup, uh, <laughs> little light, little, little small rifle, something that'd be great for uh, getting kids on, and mm. uh, it just for some reason little short lightweight bolt guns uh, bring a smile to my face anytime I shoot them. 
<laughs> that's uh, that's the exciting thing. Speaking of, of little guns, I, I wanted to ask you about some of the rimfire stuff that launched uh, as well. You know, the ones that we've seen have been, or commonly the Ruger Precision is is quite a popular one out of it, and the T T one X from Ticker, but also yep. the vo- Voodoo uh, Gunworks or the is that is that the name of it? Anyway, the one yes. from Voodoo. Yep, the uh, I believe it's the V twenty two. We got we didn't get a chance to see the Tika, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know if we just missed it while we were at range day, or we just ran out of time. Uh, okay. But yep. the uh, we we did get some trigger time on the Ruger Precision Rimfire, sure. and when I walked away from it, I told my wife that uh, I'll be I'll be buying one of those this year. Uh, <laughs> Now, again, we, we didn't get a chance to actually test any accuracy. Uh, we're just uh, hitting steel plates with it. Uh, mm-hmm. But that rifle is interesting right out of the box. It kind of, the receiver appears to be very similar to the Ruger American yeah. uh, in the, the general shape of it. Uh, but it kind of appears to be its own rifle because the mounting system for the barrel, it utilizes an AR-type mounting system, so an, an AR-type barrel nut to hold the barrel in, Okay. Uh, which got me really excited because, of course, that mm-hmm. means it opens up the uh, the aftermarket pretty significantly for it. Uh, we'll yeah. have to see when we get one in and tear it apart, actually, if it's a, a specialized receiver extension or if it's just a, a lip uh, mm-hmm. machined in the barrel holding it in uh, but using a, a screw in barrel nut like that allows a huge uh, aftermarket possibility for hand guards for barrels for all kinds of stuff yeah so uh, the one of the really novel features on it is it actually has a dual bolt throw you can decide yes. how long you want the bolt to move when you cycle the action. Yeah, so you can you can extend it out to so, feel like the other one? Yep, and if you leave the clip on, then you have your standard uh, 22 uh, bolt throw to where, you know, it's only like a, like an inch, inch and a quarter, something like that, really short. Uh, if you remove the clip, then you get a full-length bolt throw like a centerfire rifle. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that, that was really cool. He intends the... Precision Rimfire to be a training partner to the Ruger Precision Rifle. Yep. And if with that goal in mind, I think they absolutely hit it out of the park. Uh, again, assuming the accuracy is there, the uh, the features uh, shooting that rifle felt like shooting a RPR. Yeah, right. Uh, so it just you, when you get on the rifle, it it feels exactly the same. And of course, the uh, huge benefit for us here is it uh, it runs 1022 magazines. Yeah. So 1022 magazines are everywhere. I don't <laughs> I don't know how you guys are uh, are set up on uh, semi-automatic 22s since the 1022 is a semi-automatic. Yeah, it's not it's not great uh, over here. I'll put it that way. But uh, the 1022 magazines are not uncommon to find. There's still rifles around that have been popular here from Ruger with those magazines, the same style. And of course, we've got the Ruger Chargers. I don't know if that's a thing over there. The 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 is a 1022, but it's a, sold as a handgun with a short. Yeah, barrel. we we have some of those over here. I actually uh, I I've got a project in mind for one uh, that that evolves around our uh, our goofy gun laws uh, regarding pistols and uh, rifles oh, and all yes. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But uh, so the uh, the Ruger Precision Rimfire, though, overall looks like a really good setup. The only one place that I think Ruger kind of fell on their face on it is the buttstock is molded in to the lower portion of the, the firearm. So oh, no. the, the upper receiver, of course, is steel. Yeah. But the, the lower portion that houses the, the magazine well and the trigger guard and all that mm-hmm. is a uh, polymer. The, now, on the actual Ruger Precision Rifle, you know, all that's aluminum. It's all modular. And, of course, it, the Ruger Precision Rifle has an AR-type mounting system for their buttstock. Yep. I think Ruger decided to go to this all-polymer setup to try to save some money. But what they did is they tied you in to that buttstock that it comes with there's no way to replace the buttstock okay. since it's all one piece so kind of mm-hmm. uh kind of a drawback there because uh most people are not 
huge fans of the uh, stock that comes on the Ruger Precision Rifle. That's true. And the Ruger Precision Rimfire uses the, the same uh, cam lever type setup for their adjustment on their cheek piece. Okay. Okay, but you can't, can't change it out easily. Yeah, so I'll be interested to see as we go on if somebody comes up with uh, some type of adapter because just looking at it, I could see where you could cut the buttstock off and then uh, mount some kind of AR tube adapter mm -hmm. on the stub that you have left and then uh, go from there. But uh, it'll be interesting to see if the, if the aftermarket picks up a solution for that uh, going forward. It would uh, certainly, yeah, open up the market so you could, you know, if you've changed it on your Ruger Precision, to be able to change it on your Rimfire one as well and have them, have them, you know, sort of match each other. Yeah, it definitely does because a lot of guys I know that are running the uh, Ruger Precision rifles, uh, my father included, uh, after shooting the factory buttstock for a little while, he swapped over to uh, uh, Magpul PRS. I know a lot of guys have gone to, uh, like, XLR buttstocks and a few different ones out there, but... Uh, very few people I know actually keep the original factory buttstock on it for very long. Mm. Mm, absolutely. One of the things that we were looking forward to seeing was the zero compromise optics. There was a lot of uh, sort of talk about them prior to the show. How did they go down? Did you catch up with them? Uh, yeah, we did. Unfortunately, it was in a dark exhibition hall, <laughs> so... That, that is never the best place to check out uh, new optics. Mm. Uh, but they had two different optics on display there. They had a 4 to 20 uh, by 50 millimeter and a 5 to 27 by 56 millimeter. Yep. And overall, the, uh, the impression I got is it's an extremely, extremely high quality optic. The, uh, the turrets felt really good on it. They're uh, 15 mil per rev turrets. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, so you've got a lot in one turn. I mean, most uh, most competition style rifles are not going to get off that first turn. So, uh, really great uh, great overall feel on them. And the interesting point was as they were taking us through all the features on it, uh, things like the turret mechanism, where most scopes only have uh, one, I'll call it a clicker, uh, but one detent in the turret. Uh, to give you those click feels, uh, the zero compromise scope actually has two, and they're opposing uh, okay. so that they they maintain their feel for longer. Uh, little things like instead of just having a ball for that clicking detent, uh, they use a chisel point uh, type detent, so it spreads that surface area out over a wider area. Yeah, well. And uh, it should give you more durability because it will take much, much longer for that detent to wear a path um, in the turret as the turret you know, rises and lowers when you're, you're clicking it in and out. Uh, so they really they said as they went along and they made these engineering decisions, they tried to hold true to their name and not compromise anything. So if they had a choice to wear... They could make this compromise and save a little bit of money, or they could make this choice and it would cost a little bit more but result in a higher quality product. Uh, then they went with the higher quality product decision. Yeah. And yeah. Um, what most people will squawk at, of course, is that that kind of ends up being reflected <laughs> in the purchase price of, of the scope. Yeah. Uh, so these these are going to run between uh, 3200 to 3400 uh, U.S., Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of uh, it's it's definitely up there in the top end. It's running with the uh, the top end night forces and the Schmidt and Benders and that. Uh, one really interesting decision that they made is they went with a thirty six millimeter main tube. Yes. So yep. we we keep bumping up this uh, this main tube size. We, we you know thirty millimeter was the standard and and thirty four <laughs> and thirty five and thirty six. We, we're eventually just uh, going to have to f have a fifty six mil tube the whole way through, aren't we? Yeah, there you go. It's just going to be <laughs> just a straight tube. It'll look all sci fi like the <laughs> the ones you see on the uh, the movies. That's right. But uh, yeah, they said that they did that because they needed to basically work with larger internal lenses in the erector assembly and so everything in there has to get bigger and then to maintain your uh, total adjustment you have to have a bigger main tube uh, 
And it totally makes sense. The, the thing that really surprised me is, again, we're looking at these in a dark exhibition hall. I think they've, they've done a really good job on keeping that light transmission really, really high and getting as much light as possible from the front of that scope all the way back to your eyeball. Mm, yeah, I, I'm very much looking forward to getting hands-on with one. They, uh, they look like a very impressive piece of kit. Yeah, they, they're claiming that they'll, uh, they'll be available in June. So it, uh, it will be nice to, uh, to see that come out and actually hit the ground. And mm. uh, we're on the list to get them in whenever uh, they actually have models available to go out to the field. So hopefully we'll be able to take one out and twist the turrets and uh, see how well it works uh, actually out in the weather and out in the field. Yeah, it would be uh, it would be good to get some real world. That's the you know the thing about seeing it at a show versus actually seeing it in the field. But no doubt, if they've had that that attitude towards the the whole process, they are going to be an impressive impressive scope. Yeah, it it felt very high quality overall. Uh, it's always difficult uh, when you're reviewing a scope or when you're you're talking about one uh, without the ability to put one in somebody's hands mm. to to explain the feeling of quality uh, in a rifle scope. Because you can, I, I'm sure everybody has looked through the catalog at some point and saw $200 <laughs> rifle scopes that are boasting first focal plane and locking turrets and, and all this stuff. And all the same uh, feature points that you see on the $3,000 rifle scope. And they always have this question like, well, both of these have all the same stuff. Why should I spend the extra money? And uh, when you actually feel that scope and twist the turrets on it and feel the distinct clicks and, and feel the, the solidity of the tube and mm. um, how all the components go together. That there's no lash, there's no wiggle, everything just fits right and uh, feels strong. Yep. It gives you some confidence in your equipment. And the, uh, this scope definitely had that, that high quality feel to it. Everything. And, and again, we're still working with pre-production scopes. Yep. Um, yeah, you true. could tell there were, there were some differences in the anodizing, uh, the turrets that they had on the uh, the show models there. The I don't even want to call it knurling because it's not. It was uh, kind of a stylized fluting yep. uh, that was on the the outside of the turrets. wasn't exactly what the, the finished version was going to be, okay. uh, but it gives you a really good overall idea of how it's going to feel and uh, how the scope overall is going to uh, work. Uh, one cool thing that I didn't mention on it is the illumination mechanism in it. It's pretty much user programmable by dip switches. There will be a variety of different modes that you can set uh, on their illumination module, and it it gets really uh, really pretty in depth that you can set the scope up to do exactly what you want it to do. So oh, okay. uh, again, it's uh, they they packed a, a ton of features into it. Uh, really. Seems like it's going to be a really robust uh, overall mm. package. Can't wait. Sounds good. I did notice you saw quite a few different bipod uh, type setups. Did any of those stand out for you? Uh, well, the the one that definitely stands out is the new uh, BNT Industries Atlas Cal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the Atlas spy pods have been around for uh, a good while. They've gone through a uh, evolution from the the original ones through the PSR, and uh, now to the the new Cal. And you can definitely see the, the lineage as you look through each one. But uh, Casey at uh, BNT has been really good to listen to people in the field, uh, military and law enforcement, and competition shooters as well, and then take that. Uh, input and evolve the product around that. And one of the issues with the PSR bipods and some of the earlier versions of the Atlas is there really wasn't a good way to totally lock the panning out of the bipod or lock the canting out of the bipod. Uh, no matter how tight you screw down that tension wheel, uh, you could still overcome the tension wheel with the uh, movement of the rifle and that's true i mean that's just simple physics there that you've got a really long lever versus a really small wheel yeah and so you know it, it just that's the way it worked and that was something that you accepted 
with that bipod. Mm. And normally it wasn't that big of a deal. Sometimes the the panning would be a problem if you were on concrete and you were uh, panning back and forth between an array of targets. The bipod could work its way, uh, not totally sideways, but it could work its way canted. Yep. Uh, some guys didn't like the fact that you couldn't lock the cant out. So if you're shooting on a little bit of an angle, you couldn't level out the rifle and then lock it. So... All of this went into the development of the, the CAL bipod, and CAL stands for Cant and Lock. Yep. Uh, and they pretty much took the pan out of the bipod completely. And now what you have is you just have a canting hinge in the bipod, and they utilized a uh, KMW pod lock on the back of the bipod. So once you got your uh, cant lined out, uh, you can fully lock the bipod out so that it is totally rigid uh, and it won't camp at all. So there, there are some guys that are really going to like that. There are some guys that are going to want a uh, bipod that they can pan with. And so now you have really two different options. But uh, it's a really well-built bipod. It seems like the footprint on the cow is a little bit wider than the footprint on the uh, PSR or some of the uh, the earlier uh, Atlas, like the V8. Yep. Uh, so, but you still have your 45 degree leg positions. The legs still have the same uh, push button locks on them, mm -hmm. and you still have a, a pretty wide variety of attachment options to attach it onto the rifle. So, overall, it was a, a really neat setup. Uh, one of the uh, the really cool uh, additions that they made to it is the the atlas you know comes stock with these uh rubber kind of half ball feet mm -hmm. and they made a mounting point on the front of the bipod uh that accepts a screw in foot right. and so you have this little foot on there if you leave the bipod either with the legs folded back or with the legs folded straight down now you have a rubber foot as a pseudo barricade stop uh, and because it's a screw in interface, you can swap that out with pretty much anything you want. So yeah, if you want right. to put a, a cleat or a spike or something <laughs> in there, you can do that and, uh, have a, a really neat barricade stop set up. Yeah, so that's, that's smart. I just having a look at them now actually. And yeah, that I see what you mean. They look, uh, look like a good upgrade. Yeah. He's, uh, he's really put a lot of work into, uh, into that bipod and, uh, it's, it still accepts the uh, the same kind of extensions that the uh, original uh, Atlas, uh, or not original Atlas, the V8 and the uh, the PSR. It still utilizes uh, the same kind of extensions and feet and stuff. So you can you can swap stuff around, or if you've got a bunch of stuff for a PSR, then then it should work on the the cal. And the legs do not uh, rotate, so they're more like the uh, PSR yep. to where there there's a groove down them, so that those feet uh, won't swivel mm -hmm. on you, and so it allows you to load the bipod uh, with a little bit more uh, force uh, to resist those higher recoiling rifles. Did you manage to have a play with a modular uh, evolution bipod? Uh, we did. We got by and uh, took a look at it, and uh, it. Again, is a, a pretty interesting design. Uh, it utilizes uh, carbon fiber legs instead of uh, aluminum or steel legs like we see on a lot of, a lot of other bipods mm -hmm. out there. Um, the it, it really offers a lot of modularity, I mean, hence the name. Yep. Uh, but one of the things that I will really be interested to see when we get one in to review is how durable those uh, carbon fiber legs are going to be. Because yeah. they are hollow carbon fiber tubes. Um, and bipod legs receive a ton of abuse <laughs> in the field. I mean, I'm, I have a habit of when I, when I drop down behind a rifle on a soft surface, I dig those bipod legs in and really load the rifle and... That allows you to get the quickest follow-up shots that you possibly can. Yep. And that just that's putting a ton of forward force on the rifle to begin with. And then every time the rifle recoils, you're unloading and reloading those legs. And I have seen at a couple of uh, competitions, I've seen modular evolution bipods fail on the field. Uh, and I don't know if those were previous versions. I wasn't in a position where I could follow up 
with the uh, the owner okay. and uh, find out what version they were or what the uh, resolution was. But I I have seen them fail out there. I've seen the legs break. It does have some neat features on it. As I said, the modularity, the ability to uh, quickly swap back and forth and go from a prone bipod uh, to a sitting or a, a kneeling height yeah. bipod to be able to get over high grass and, and obstacles. Uh, and also things like they put a uh, Arca rail interface on the bottom. So if you mm-hmm. run something like our really right stuff tripod, uh, then you don't need an extra plate. You can just snap the bottom of the bipod into the top of the tripod oh, cool. and lock it in. And go. Yeah, right. Was there anything else from the show that stood out for you? Uh, there were uh, well, there were a couple of other things. Um, one that we've been talking to for a while is um, Accuracy Solutions has got a, an interesting setup uh, called the Bipod X, and mm-hmm. it is the the best way to describe it, I guess, would be a carbon fiber tube that mounts under the forend of your rifle. And now you attach the bipod to the forward end of the carbon fiber tube. Mm -hmm. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to move that bipod mounting point closer to the muzzle of your rifle, and in some cases even beyond the muzzle of your rifle, uh, to extend the length of the footprint on your your rifle between your bipod and your rear bag. And, I mean, if you look at the geometry on it, that will make the rifle more stable. the question in my mind, though, is if the stability is worth the added bulk. And uh, we got a chance to uh, to sit down and discuss a lot of the uh, the pros and the cons on it. I'm not 100% sold on it yet, but I haven't taken it out to the range. I haven't shot stages with it. So I, to be fair to the product, I haven't used it in a way yet that allows me to really come to it. Uh, but I highly recommend anybody to go out and actually watch the uh, the video that we did with Accuracy Solutions out there and yep. really listen to them explain to us uh, how that bipod works now for or how the uh, the extension works now for ELR shooters guys that are really stretching out with uh, these bigger guns I think it totally makes sense because if you can get that bipod really far forward. Um, then it's going to minimize the any movement at the buttstock of the rifle. It's going to minimize the effect it has on your sight picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in, in that aspect, it makes a ton of sense. I can also see in some uh, precision rifle stages uh, where you're shooting through barricades or you're shooting through various different obstacles where just being able to have a rigid device underneath your muzzle that you can set on the barricade, mm. again, gives you, it lengthens that overall distance, and now you've got a, a rigid support. You don't have your muzzle or your barrel resting on something. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, it has some really interesting possibilities, and it's a somewhat light system. It's uh, aluminum and carbon fiber, and they're actually bringing out a sporter version for guys that okay. uh, want to be able to put it on lighter weight hunting rifles. Yep. So uh, really, really interesting system with some uh, some possibilities. Now, the, the drawback to it is it looks different than anything else that's out there right now. <laughs> True. Uh, and, you know, precision rifle shooters aren't the most vain bunch out there, but uh, nobody wants their rifle to look goofy. And so if somebody, you know, assumes that something looks goofy, then it probably uh, tempers their interest in it a little bit. Uh, so the fact that this does look different, hmm. uh, we'll see uh, how much that weighs in people wanting to try it and get on it. But they're doing a good job of, of uh, getting out to different matches, to different shooting events, and uh, letting people try the product. They'll be out at a lot of the, the Guardian Long Range matches here in the U.S., yep. uh, so it'll, it'll be a chance for people to actually get on the product and, and see how well it works. Sensational. Yeah, it certainly is a, a unique looking thing, and I, I I resonate what you say. Yeah, although you may get some shooters that will try it because it looks unusual, looks different. So the <laughs> the early adopters may be on board with that pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it it definitely had a 
an interesting look to it. It looks unique, which that can be a benefit in the long run because it makes it very identifiable. I mean, you're not going to mistake if a shooter is using one or not yeah. when they go up stage. So True. Uh, that may work out for them well in the long run if it catches on and people decide that, hey, it's a, a worthwhile addition. And those guys that are really rocking for that um, top position in competition – they're less worried about what something looks like yep. versus how many points it's going to give them on a stage. So That's right. um, it may be something that once it starts catching on with some of the top shooters that it, it trickles down and uh, becomes a, a normal thing to see on the firing lines. That will be uh, an interesting one to follow. They, they do look very intriguing, very intriguing. <laughs> I am curious as to how a government, an entire government shuts down, by the way, because I, I know that that affected uh, some of the actions for Ultimatum uh, at the show. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, and um, and I, I've, it's a, such a foreign, well, literally foreign concept for us uh, over here um, that an entire government can shut down. But that that obviously have had an effect on the show. Yeah, well, it's... it's uh... Unfortunately, it's not a foreign concept here. It still uh, baffles me uh, how that can work. I, I still think that um, if our government shuts down, uh, some of our politicians should just forfeit their salary. And Agreed. I think that might uh, that might prevent some of that nonsense. But yeah, um, we heard from uh, from quite a few of the larger companies that have military contracts uh, that it kind of hurt them because. Uh, of course, they're meeting with uh, government and military officials uh, to talk about contracts and finalize things and that. And um, when the government shuts down, they stop writing checks and uh, all travel gets suspended. You know, so it's uh, wow. it's kind of an ugly thing. And it caused uh, some of them to have to cancel meetings and uh, not be able to conduct business. So uh, that does hurt a little bit, but it really, as you mentioned, it really hurt Ultimatum Precision and uh, some of the other companies that had to bring stuff in uh, because when the government shuts down, then there are some key steps that they have to go through to make sure that their firearms are approved for import into the country. And uh, it ended up with uh, them not being able to get uh, some of their uh, their display guns and their uh, well, I guess all their display actions into the U.S. So mm. uh, they kind of ended up with, uh, luckily they had a large 3D printed model of the uh, ultimatum deadline action. That. And that was up there so so people could actually see what the action looked like. Um, but I'll tell you, we, uh, we've got one here in the shop that was actually waiting for us when we got back from SHOT Show. Mm. And really the selling point is when you feel the action. Uh, you know, Ultimatum brought out the, the U-300. Um, it's probably a year, year and a half ago now. Yeah. And there were some there were some issues with that action. Mm. Uh, it ticked a lot of boxes. It is a really beefy overall action. Had some really good features on it. Uh, but the bolt lift was still uh, fairly heavy. And that's one of the drawbacks. The, the Ultimatum is a three-lug, 60-degree um, bolt throw. And... Most of us are used to the bolt throw on a 90-degree bolt throw, like a Remington or a Savage, yeah. uh, the regular two-lug actions. And when you think about it, with those actions, you've got 90 degrees in which to cock the striker assembly. Uh, so you've got a longer, shallower ramp that you have to drag that weight up uh, to get it to its fully cocked position. When you reduce the amount of bolt lift down to 60 degrees that you have with the three lug action, uh, now you have a sharper ramp that you have to pull that load up, uh, and so it makes it a heavier bolt lift. And there's this, there seems to be a finite window on uh, where you get to a point where it's too heavy to quickly operate the action. Uh, I've worked with uh, with high end actions long enough that I get spoiled by the fact that when I fire the rifle, I can just blade my hand, uh, flick my wrist upwards, and mm -hmm. that's all that's required to flick that bolt handle up and to cock the action. So when you get into some of these uh, shorter bolt lift actions and you're no longer able to do that, you actually have to release your grip on the rifle, grab the bolt handle, and rock it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives you a negative perception 
of the, the action overall. So and they did things to try to improve the bolt lift, but uh, from what I'm understanding, in the at the end, they just decided, okay, we've had to make too many improvements or changes or concessions, so they pretty much just scrapped the U300 completely, and that's when they brought out the deadline. Uh, and the deadline action fixed everything that I disliked about the U300. Okay. Uh, our U300 never actually made it into a completed rifle, uh, but the uh, the deadline that we have sitting here absolutely uh, will be built out within the next couple of months, and it has a very smooth, um, fairly light bolt lift. I haven't actually put a scale on it and measured it compared to, say, an Accuracy International, um, but the, the bolt lift feels very nice, and it, uh, it is a replaceable uh, three-lug bolt head as well. Uh, so the way the action is set up, you could very easily uh, do a switch barrel setup. Uh, it has uh, the recoil lug is integrated into the action, and it utilizes a uh, barrel nut type system to lock the barrel in. See, you could set up your primary rifle as a, as a six dasher. Uh, then you could have a 223 barrel and a 223 bolt face. And when you're not actually shooting a match, if you're going to go out and train, then you can screw off that dasher barrel, screw a 223 barrel on, put the uh, appropriate bolt head on, and now you've just converted your primary match rifle with your uh, original optic uh, into a 223 trainer. Mm. And again, you still have that, that uh, short bolt lift. Uh, you still have the same trigger, the same action, the same stock, all that fun stuff. Is that a is that a long process to change over the barrel and the the bolt face? Um, the bolt face, no, uh, and the bolt face actually is uh, a toolless changeover. Wow. Uh, you you remove the cocking assembly from the bolt. There's a cross pin that you push out. You slide out the one bolt, slide the other bolt in, put the pin back in, put the cocking assembly back in, and you're done swapping the bolt out. Um, swapping the barrel out uh, take a little bit longer because you you do have to torque that barrel nut down. Yep. So you'll need you uh, to either uh, clamp the barrel in a vise, or uh, Ultimatum also has their their action wrench for it, so you can go uh, clamp the uh, the action in and then spin the barrel off. So it's not something that you would want to do at the range like you can uh, with some of the other true multi caliber switch barrel systems. Um, it's definitely not as easy as say an, an AX multi-caliber or a, a Desert Tech SRS, yep. uh, but it also isn't in the same price range <laughs> right. as, uh, as those rifles. You're talking about a thousand uh, dollar action um, mm -hmm. to to be able to to swap around there. So uh, it's obviously not something that everyone is going to do, but it's interesting that the capability is there. What really excites me about these types 